Hey, did you know there's a lot more going on right now at our websites? Are you watching all four of them? If not, check them out. There's a list right here. We got three YouTube channels and one audio-only channel for your enjoyment. So come on and dig in and see all the stuff we do here at the North American Snow Queen Palace. It's Ms. Marie Delaney, and today I'm going to be discussing uh, something I was thinking about a couple days ago, uh, based on originally the concept was originally discussed many, many, many years ago about cloning of genetic material and how if everybody has the same genetic material, which is something that Darwin would never have supported, it'd be very easy to kill one, could kill the rest of them. And then I started thinking about that, how it applies to computers, especially with all the new malware and the spyware and Trojans and all the other crap that's out there. And so I started to um, give it some thought. And I realized, like I said, it applies to computers. And I happen to have one of my... Um, yeah, the cat too. He's <laughs> always here. He's always here. Um, but you're not going to bother me up today, are you? Again, let me get my demonstration done. Hmm? Uh, I hope so. We'll see. Um, this computer, by the way, is the uh, second of line of this computer redo. Um, this one came out a little bit later than the original, um, but it certainly is uh, a machine that is still... Actually, it's really the same motherboard inside. It's just a new case. I'm talking, of course, the Commodore 64 and the ever-so-popular Epix Fast Load Cartridge. You don't need this really to use this, but oh well. Um, There's a fancy story. This cartridge sold millions of these. They were become. They really did make a difference in operating the 1541 disk drive, and uh, but uh, that's not the issue here. The topic. So let's just leave this off for now. Um, this is the American version of the Commodore 64. The British version is not much different. It's just that. It's it's got the same power supply except the horses is wired for two hundred and thirty hertz at fifty I mean two hundred thirty volts at fifty hertz. And their um output chip is PAL instead of NTSC. Um but this is the American version. So if I was to demonstrate this to you on our network, we would have to um find a way to convert the NTSC video to PAL. Um so we could show it to you. That was what I did not buy, but I did want it to buy that, um, but that's another topic. Um, the Commodore 64C, it stands for Commodore 64 Compact. Unlike the original tan bread box, this is a little bit lower height. I don't like this case as much. I like the big rounder edge of the red box Commodore 64 because it was very easy for me to um, get my hands have a resting place. They try to make this more ergodynamic. Uh, as you can see, it's got a lower profile. Um, when it comes to this computer, I don't like this case. I really don't. So what I might want to do, since it's the same motherboard inside, is to take this case off and put a regular bread box, Commodore 64, out with a matching keyboard. And um, it would give it a nice look to it. I added something to it. You probably see it. You wonder what the hell this red button is. Well, um, there's a reset switch. Um, when you press it, it brings the computer back to a cold start. Um, by using the cold start um, interrupt jump on the computer processor um, kernel jump table, uh, you can use this to reset the machine so it can start fresh. Uh, there are some Commodore 1541 accessories. Um, that use this signal when it plugs into the serial bus, uh, which is this thing here. You could say this is the predecessor to USB. Um, it's not quite as smart as USB, uh, but it was, um, it's still pretty much uses the same concept. It is synchronous. It is not asynchronous, where standard USB is asynchronous. This is not. This is synchronous. Um, bidirectional bus. Okay. 
This has got the 8 pin uh, Commodore 64 video cable connection. You can use the 5 pin cables from the older Commodore 64s that have the luminance signal um, as one pin composite. Yes, and our cable is available for this to allow you to plug this into an S video connection on your TV or video monitor so that you don't have to use a um, special Commodore monitor. Because really, it is standard S video signal. It is mono though, it's not stereo. Now, people have added a second SID chip to make it stereo, but that's not the point. Is What was nice about this computer is when it has its operating system, it's ROM or read only memory, it is burned onto the chip in the factory. It is therefore is carved in stone. So a virus writer would have to find a way to copy the ROM to RAM and then sh take or uh, turn off the uh, the ROM to access the RAM underneath by shadowing. Um, that um, doesn't have an advantage for tweaking and making fine tuning on the machine. But unfortunately, it also makes the computer highly susceptible um, to uh, being cracked by bad people. Uh, on the other hand, most people didn't do that. What the Commodore 64 was loved for was the fact is that it was very convenient. You just plugged in the mains power supply adapter here, your cassette player or a disk drive in here. Here's where your cassette drive goes. The uh, the serial port drive is over here, I think it is. Yep, the Commodore 64 is right here, and you're all set to go. Power it up. There's no need to put it in the boot disk. It just comes right up and, and works. Um, but because of that reason, uh, because Commodore wanted to keep things fairly independent, um, there is a series. There's a series, a standard series of load and save commands that are used to access um, so anything. Um, it was the beginning of device independence. Uh, that in fact, the Commodore 1541, the Commodore 1581 works fine here. 1571 works fine in standard speed. Um, the, as I said, the commands for loading and saving are the same between tape and disk and hard drive and whatever. So um, it didn't really make much of a difference. It's device specific commands could be sent using the open statement and um, such as to, uh, you know, format disks and things like that. Uh, as I said, this machine is my um, my second Commodore 64. My first Commodore 64 um, had a power supply, heart attack, and uh, destroyed the whole computer. I'm really kind of frowned out about it because I really miss it. It was my original bread box, and uh, this one works. This has got, obviously, um, unfortunately, the Commodore 64 and the 1541 and the Atari 2600 have the same problem, and that is your exposed pins of your your or of your of your of your joystick ports are right here. These, and if you get careless and you don't realize, the Commodore 64 had originally had a metal shield, which was a plus. As long as you touch the metal shield with your finger. And you could discharge your finger before you accidentally land on top of the pins. So what happens is sometimes when people are turning it all off, is they put the finger right on top of these sockets and they don't realize if they got any electric charge, they're going to blow out the, uh, the CIA or the PIA chips. And that's the reason uh, why these computers often break down, is because of damage to the PIA or CIA chip. Uh, the PIAs are using the VIC-20, the CIAs are using the Commodore 64 and the Commodore 128. Uh... Like I said, let's get back to the original idea back in the 80s. Computers were all different. There was no two computers that were the same. They all had different processors. They all had different memory. They all had different um, uh, um, designs. So for if you were to make a virus a Trojan for one, there's no guarantee that it was going to spread throughout the network to all the other computers. Never mind the fact that we didn't have the Internet back then. But let's just say we did, okay? I mean, the only way you're going to make a worm is it would have to run through using the standard um, JavaScript. Um, it would have to use this, this common, the most common standard to begin to impact the computer operating. But since the Camera 64 has all of its operating system in ROM, unless you're using Geos, I did know that there were some Geos viruses out there, but I don't really know much about them. Um, it really... Um, 
was harder for um, a virus to really spread from machine to machine. Um, now, of course, this is the most common way people used to get programs for the commoner was on cartridges, which happened to be I had my cartridge plugged in when they pulled this up, so I might as well talk about this. As I said, this is the Epix Fast Slug. This is the original. I bought. I was given this for Christmas one year back in 1984, um, and it has been in my machine pretty much ever since. And if you look at the pins, you can see um, the insertion points of the pins, or, or so you can see this one aware on this. And this it still works. Um, this cartridge was a big seller back in those days. And people still use, who have Commerce 64s, have these today. They're still laying around in their uh, Commerce 64 goodie bag. <laughs> I don't want to call it that. Um, but, um, okay, so back to what I was saying. So one, one of the things that was discussed in genetics, which applies to computer says, everybody has got the same pretty much computer processors. Um, there's three ma there's two major chips still being used today, uh, chip families, I should say. Um, the first one is the Intel line, the, which is Intel architecture 64-bit and the Intel architecture 32-bit. We'll just kind of call that Intel because that's what it is. And the second one that is becoming very popular now is ARM, A-R-M. Um, PowerPC, unfortunately, is for almost all applications today is off the menu. It's not going to be something that a cracker is going to go for um, because the number of PowerPC computers are uh, slowly dwindling away. This video, by the way, is done on a PowerPC machine. So um, it's... It's no surprise to uh, see how today's computers have become so easy to write a virus for it. Yes, there is the operating system layer on, on top of every chip, but if it's an Intel Mac or if it's a Windows 10 PC or Windows XP PC, it's very easy to sneak in a, sneak in a raw binary executable that could do bad things to you. I mean, I mean, operating systems are not exactly foolproof, okay? They are easy to crack and cause great damage, especially anything that basically has to load from a disk into RAM is definitely uh, a target. And like I said, just like once you copy the RAM, the ROM to RAM on this, once it's in RAM, you can do anything you want to it. Operating systems have gotten so huge, you can actually run things in the background, and the average user will never know what the hell you're doing. That's how these viruses and trojans are able to execute and and, and sub, um, 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 what do they call those things there? Uh, spam bots, uh, spam back factories, distributed spamming of people it is to actually run programs in the background to, um cause damage. The days can be so damn fast, you won't even realize that most there's a program running in the background. And even if you were to look at the background processes, which one's the spam bot one? You couldn't tell because most modern computers, number one, our uh, operating systems, um, background tasks usually have funny names, and there's like so many programs. Unfortunately, the biggest problem is, is that the operating systems themselves this information is not readily available, so you can tell which is a standard system program and which is some virus trojan that's running. And you know, virus trojans really technically are too sneaky. The problem is, is what they're succeeded in doing is they're using the um, the obfuscation of the um, operating system manual, not telling you, for example, say what at run.cmd is doing, or at run.exe, or at run.bin does. Okay? In other words, they'll give you a whole, a whole bunch of programs running in the background of every minor computer that the average person has no idea what it is to begin with. So, if somebody, if there's a program called twinkletoes.api, um, dot, um, bin, you wouldn't know what twinkletoes.api.bin is because it's not it, it, that might be the actual virus or val malware that's running on your machine making a spam bot. But the problem is, is how can you tell that is legitimate versus, um, say, command.com? 
on, on a Windows XP. I mean, if you're going to go on the command.cmd, if you're trying to run programs, how are you supposed to know what's what? You can't because there's just too many programs and the operating system manufacturers don't even tell you or give you a full description of what any of these programs do. So they actually kind of help the malware uh, by number one, giving them easy entry to your computer by using a standard operating system and also by ob obfuscation or let's make it easy. Maybe people don't understand what, what, what programs are running in the background. So on the whole night, you could sneak water in broad sight and the average person would never know. And besides that, most people don't even think of looking at the background tasks on the computer. I mean, I can look on an activity monitor on my Mac, and I can tell you right now, I don't even know what one quarter of that shit is. <laughs> I, know it's, I know it's original Apple stuff because my operating system is virus and Trojan free. But still, I got a few programs I added in there that I do know what they do, so just command drivers and things like that. And um, But like I said, I'm more savvy than some. And just as Lumi's more savvy with me on the spirituality stuff. Yep. So anyway, so how did today's computers compare with these computers from 1983, 85? Well, first of all, today's computers are very easily to um, take down with a, with, a, with a bang because the fact is that there are so many of them using the standard architecture or close to it. I mean, the Intel 32-bit and the 32 and 64-bit architecture chips are used in so many PCs and servers now that... Um, it doesn't really take much to uh, figure out how to uh, sneak a program in that's going to run um, pretty much the same on a Mac or a PC. Uh, second problem is is that all operating systems are loaded in ROM or in RAM, not in ROM. So it's very easy to create a modified version of the operating system, which is great for development. But once it's done, you know, um, well, the average individual is like in deep guano. Um, and Mr. Cat, I don't mind you being here, but you're going to have to let me work, okay? And every time I do a demo with this cat, he's always here. Um, so those two reasons are why the standard modern PCs are, um, there's too many reasons. But the third reason is simply not the, it's not really, really easy to pick any, pick puns at, or her pick, um, nits at as much, is because part of the problem is user and manufacturer. The manufacturer, for example, has wanted to keep, um, except for Linux, which tends to be a little more easier to find information on, but even that's not always easy to find exactly what programs are running in the background and processes. Manufacturers, for the most part, like to keep their hood shut. They don't like to show you, for example, what programs are running in the background to make the operating system work. Uh, Windows, uh, for a long time, has been in this leak. And that has led to people kind of going, well, gee, I don't know what programs I'm supposed to be running in the background. And, and some cracker knows that. And they're going to go in there and they're going to start trouble. Now, the hackers, the good guys, not the crackers, the bad guys, I will always make sure, plus one thing, always is a sore thing with me, is please do not call the good guys crackers. They're not bad guys. And don't call bad guys hackers because they're not good guys. Call them what they are. You want to call them cyber thieves? That's what the crackers, unfortunately, have become. Um, so these computers here, um, the Commodore 64, as I said, wow, these keys are hard. Yeah. I I kind of, I haven't used the Commodore 64 in so long. I mean, compared to my, Commodore, uh, compared to my Mac, these keys are, like, stiffer. They're not as spongy. Yeah, as spongy. Um... I think my original Com 64, the keys are a little softer. This case, you beat the hell out of them, I think. Probably. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that um, now, and so the manufacturers have resulted in the average user uh, unaware of what's going on because they're keeping the stuff proprietary and they're not making it readily available to the users. And the second thing is users... Um, don't even know where to begin looking for the information to determine how secure the machine is because they may not be fully educated. It's kind of like I was watching on uh, a, a videotape of Looney Tunes, uh, a comedy show, which is the, the newer one, when Speedy Gonzalez was talking about his pizza restaurant commercial for Pizza Riva. Pizza Riva. Yeah. And he said his uh, cook, I, I, thought, I thought you knew computers. 
I used to have a computer. And then he asked this guy to write the website. Well, first of all, it was a very common problem even back then in the 80s was that in fact is just because a person had a computer, you said they're a computer wizard. That didn't work out that way. That still doesn't work out today, that way. Um, that's like saying it's just because you have a licensed gun owner and now you're a gunsmith. <laughs> you're not a gunsmith unless you went to school to learn how to make guns. But um, what are you doing? He's always stationing me. You know, I think it's the cat that makes your videos more exciting. You think so? Uh, I think so. I mean, because, let's be honest, this video isn't exactly something I would want to sit there and watch. Okay, I'll give you that. Two points for you. Ding! Zero points for you. <clears throat> oh, come on. Okay. Um... So the point is, is that there has to be changes made. First thing is, just like, just like Dor Charles Darwin said, you got to diversify. Um, you got to have genetic diversity to protect um, your computers from um, the bad guys. Because if they're going to go ahead and they're going to write viruses and script damage to um, PCs, such as like Windows XP, so you have these things called script kitties. And that's kitties, not kitties. Oh, God. I could see your cat trying to write a script to Windows XP. <laughs> you can just see it. More meow mix, please. <laughs> okay. The truth is, like, can I go back to seriousness? Please do. Okay. If you want to protect your computers, you've got to be able to have diversify. You've got to have different kinds of machines in your network to protect yourself. If everything is the same, Okay, homogeneous design, same processor, same memory, same or similar operating system, same just drive design, same, same mouse and keyboard. It doesn't take no rocket scientist to figure out that um, you could destroy somebody's computer uh, just by um, creating something stupid. And people did do that in the old days. Um, but today's computers are much better designed because they are... Um, in one sense, they're made cheaper. I mean, that's true. And the fact is that you can get computers now. Um, in fact, you can probably find a Raspberry Pi in a box of cereal. Really? Or a Cracker Box. Cracker Jack Box. Yeah. Because it's so inexpensive now. The little tiny single board computers, you could buy them for like, almost like pennies. I actually had the option of buying a machine today. Uh, on the market for like thirty dollars. Yeah, I gotta answer the phone. I was uh, Dory. Um, she's gonna come over later tonight. So, um, so anyway, today's computers. As I said, you can buy a computer now for like twenty, thirty dollars. Little tiny micro computer, like a Raspberry Pi, postage stamp machine, or you know whatever. And then you can program that and do things with it, but. The point is, is they all have the same issue. They all have uh, a very standardized chipset, depending on uh, either it's based either usually on Intel or ARM, as the most common flavors. But there are other uh, fairly common chip um, microcontroller brain systems. But that's quite different than say um, back in the early days of computers when everything was. Everybody had their own flavor. How about what processors were the most common back in the 80s? Well, we had the 6502 by Moss, the 6510 by Moss, um, the Xilinx Z80 chip, the Intel 8080 chip. Um, you had the variation of the 8080, which is called the 8085, which is used in my Model 102. You have... Um, the um, Motorola 68000 series chips, which are used in Macs. Um, there was no standardized operating system. There was no, I mean, that was just like everything had its own operating system, had its own dish format, everything had its own internet connectors, um, like internet connection, I should say, not connectors. Like this one here has your standard 24-pin uh, Commodore user port, which has uses a software-based keyword called the 6551. And um, some computers used um, 
DB9, some use DB25, some are male or some are female, some are using uh, specialized proprietary company connectors. The only thing back in the old days that was standardized was on um, most models were either Bell 103 or uh, Bell 212A modems were the standards. That was the only thing that was standardized. And once, I mean, when the part that plugged into the phone wall, into the wall, was the most standardized part for the phone. And, uh, uh, obviously what the power plug that plugged into the wall was also the most, was the most standard. Everything else was companies had their own design of everything. Now people came up with all kinds of crazy ways to hook this gear up. And uh, I'm thinking about seriously playing around with some of the proprietary technologies. Um, but this whole video is, um, you know, is to talk about, as I said, is what we need to do to protect our modern computers from the crackers is to diversify. Diversify, be unique, be creative, be self-sufficient. Don't depend on buying the same thing that everybody else buys. Because that's just guaranteed uh, to make your life a living hell. If everybody's operating system is the same. It's just like if you all had a clone of yourself. If, if you get sick, that means your clones are going to get sick. If your clones get sick, you're going to get sick. Because what kills them is going to kill you because you are all got the same genetic makeup. Um, it's the same thing. Um, just like what Charles Darrow was talking about, diversification of the species applies just as much to computers as it does to um, everything else. Um, so, by the way, thank you very much, everybody, for your donations. I just want to remind you that it's been a real blessing that you have been helping me and want me to reach out to you. And we got a long way to go in life, but we're going to keep working on it. And Mr. Kitty Cat looks happy. Meow. Hmm. Meow. Yeah, he's happy. Yeah, he's happy. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and Dory's going to be coming tonight, so maybe uh, we'll try to get a few different videos in, Dory and this, and I don't know. We'll try. Oh, by the way, the, uh, we did use the last donation to buy 250 gigabyte hard drive uh, that will be here. Uh, it's according to the... Uh, um, Postal Service site it says here should probably be here on the 24th and that will be used to allow us to have more working space for the video productions because right now the problem is is really running out of room we have a lot of standard boilerplate as they call it and we like to use it and the problem is is it takes room the things that we use standard boilerplate as it's called we keep in one in one direction petition and the things that are our production work is in another petition um, that has a couple advantages and disadvantages. Uh, advantages is that if for some reason I erase my copy of the boilerplate off my, my working petition, the original, um, that our original sources are safely tucked away in its original petition for the system. It also allows us to keep the fragmentation issue, um, that can slow computer down quite a bit. In fact, if you're really smart, you should try to make sure to, um, diversify your technology a bit. Don't have all the operating system stuff on one computer in case a virus or a Trojan comes in. Spread the love. Give the code to the other computers to hold on to at least. Back stuff up onto those disks, tapes, whatever, and then you'll always have it in a protection backup. And if my main Mac ever goes up in smoke, or if my Linux machine goes up in smoke, I've got this as a backup. It's got a word processor, it's got a printer, and I can print and still do things. Uh, Getting things up onto YouTube with this, I get it. <laughs> it just isn't fast enough to process a video. If I could manage to put a video in here, um, it would probably take weeks uh, to process a video like we do. Weeks. Uh, but, oh well, I guess if you're desperate enough, you might do it. You might, you might do it, yeah. All right, so that's it, guys. But for now, oh, please, don't forget to like or dislike, comment in the section below, share with your friends and enemies, and of course, uh, we will get something going for you. Okay? That's all. Bye-bye.